Here's a story. One fine morning, as I was completing a femoropopetial artery bypass operation in an operation theater in Mapsa, North Goa, I was given a message to come over to the surgical intensive care to see a patient. The patient, a 42-year-old gentleman on a business trip to Goa, had presented four days prior with a spontaneous pneumothorax. The general surgeon attached to the hospital had instituted an underwater seal drainage of the pneumothorax, but the lung had continued to leak vigorously even four days later. The patient was himself an experienced allied healthcare professional, and it was not long before his doctor friends from Mumbai had started asking some difficult questions. Why was the air leak persisting? Was it a case of a ruptured emphysematous bulla? Was there a bronchopneumon fistula? Was there a need for a surgical closure of the suspected bronchopleural fistula? The patient family had even started planning to move the, him back to Mumbai for treatment when one of the patient's doctor friends in Goa happened to mention my name to them. Those were my early days in Goa. I had just returned to Goa some six months earlier and there I was at the patient's bedside for an opinion technically at the patient's family request. I examined the patient, assessed the air leak from the lung and into the drainage bottle, reviewed the available chest x-rays and the CT scan of the chest. The lung was not fully re-expanded and definitely in need of some additional measures, be it a negative suction in the least and with the possibility of a thoracoscopic intervention at the back of my mind. As far as a patient consent for treatment is concerned, I am a believer in two facts which mandate a personalized approach. Number one, I believe a standard consent form has no role in specialist clinical practice. Just as each and every person is unique, so is the case with each and every patient. The clinical response and outcome of patient A to the same medication or same uncomplicated procedure, for example an appendicectomy, will not be exactly identical to patient B. Age, body weight, comorbid conditions differ and so does the risk and the results. Point number two, the consent for treatment is a very important communication. It can have serious implications for the trust and loyalty in a doctor-patient relationship and even invite a consumer litigation if not executed well. I believe it's not an exercise which can be delegated to the junior most member of your team. Ideally, it's a responsibility to be handled by you the team captain. So let's get back to the SICU in that hospital at Mapsa Goa and the patient with the spontaneous pneumothorax. I explained the possible course of treatment to the patient, the anticipated risk and the expected results. The patient insisted, however, that his senior chest physician friend from Mumbai wanted to speak to me. He dialed in, put the phone on a speaker, and passed on the handset to me. At that time, my anesthetist, Dr. Sandeep, had accompanied me to the SICU and happened to be there. He was not very pleased as I patiently listened to the chest physician. The fact was that here was a case wherein 
a chess physician was narrating a step-by-step -step instruction guide to a fully qualified cardiothoracic surgeon. The toughest part was to swallow the bitter pill at the end, wherein the chest surgeon made an unfair statement on cardiothoracic surgeon fast-forwarding an avoidable intervention. Anyway, I chose to swallow the bitter pill silently, reiterated my proposed plan of treatment to the chest physician, and apologized for my inability to guarantee success of a conservative approach. I asked the family if they had any additional queries, left it to the family to take a call on whether they were comfortable with my plan or wanted to do the journey back to Mumbai and to inform me accordingly about their further course of action. The family chose to be treated as per my plan. The patient settled down with negative suction, patience and yes, prayers. I had the chest drain removed after a week and the patient returned hale and hearty to Mumbai 10 days later. It's 15 years since we first met in the surgical ICU in Mapsagoa. For 15 years, I have not only had the privilege of being his close confidant, but also having him as a staunch advocate and an ambassador of my practice. Every patient, even the toughest physically, will be tested psychologically when in a hospital for any treatment. You may be well aware of some of your close friends, physically tough, literally turning the world upside down for just an intramuscular injection. It's therefore important that we take the time and the personal responsibility to allay a patient's fears while sincerely explaining the road to follow. I will end up with a very important tip. Never underplay the risk, the cost, and the need for additional treatment if required. It's not uncommon for doctors to downplay the risks and the costs for fear of losing a patient. Such an approach will only result in creating a family of disappointed patients when the estimates go haywire. As a matter of fact, overestimating the risk, the cost and the need for additional treatments would be a more fair approach. Any outcome thereafter will always be a bonus. I trust you to do well and learn from this story. God bless you.